Sean Cheatham. Welcome to the Undraped Artist Podcast. Thanks, Jeff. Nice to nice to be here. Nice to see you. Yeah, it's good to see you, man. I've been following you, as you know, forever. And the thing is, I'm super excited to interview you because you're one of those rare people that's a Renaissance man and in in, uh, in this century, which it seems like everyone's so specialized, but like Thank everything you. you touch is perfection. So I'm super yeah, well, excited to interview you. you about that and talk and talk about everything that you've got your hands in right now. And uh, yeah, it's a lot of stuff. Yeah, it is. It's pretty awesome. And you know, and we are painting mostly podcast, but you know what, forget it for all you people that don't want to see this other stuff, you know, <laughs> too bad, because I'm freaking excited <laughs> to talk about all this stuff. Nice. Um, all right. So but first of all, I kind of want to know your background, like, tell me a little bit about where you came from, and how you got into, I want to say the painting field, but you're kind of in everything. But let's just start with painting take off from there how'd you get yeah, into that okay yeah yeah painting's definitely been my main love my whole life i grew up in san francisco just kind of doing regular kid 80s stuff i was born in the late 70s so I spent my whole youth kind of riding bicycles around san francisco skateboarding making art i mean not thinking of it career wise or anything um my mom is chinese so her side of the family does like actually there was a lot of artists so i kind of grew up around people who were doing it had done it professionally were maybe doing it professionally or just did it for fun too like christmas dinners one of my mom's cousins he he could draw so well like I, my memories of his drawings when i was a kid are like those kind of academic chinese studies portrait studies like of my dad just passed out at christmas dinner on the couch or whatever really but full shading yeah and i just used to see him do these things and so and i would draw with him and 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 uh, my grandmother and other people so it, it was just always part of life we did it my dad was a jeweler growing up um and he retired from that so he's kind of um he was drawing a lot when I was a kid too. Like he loved drawing like Disney characters and things and just sitting with us and doing it. And, uh, so everybody was doing art in my family and, um, so you got on both sides as, from your dad career. and your mom. Yeah. 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 Well, my dad's more of like the technician with like the jewelry and stuff, but man, I've seen some of his like old, like gouache paintings of jewelry designs where it's just like fully made up renderings of like, gems and, and gold and metal so yeah he definitely had that so i think i get a little bit more of the kind of technical and the i don't know just the that kind of detail oriented side from my dad and then just like the straight art art and painting and drawing from my mom's side hmm. so so that was that and i just kind of went to grew up going to kind of catholic school being an altar boy doing all that stuff roman catholic father kind of thing and uh just doing school you know i don't know like i, I Finally, when I was 18, I had to go to college just to stay in school and please the powers that were. And I started taking the art classes along with the regular classes. Um, and I kept dropping out of classes that weren't art classes and just taking more art classes. Really? And realizing at that point, yeah, like, I mean, I was still, so I've told this in a few podcasts, but where I, I, I honestly thought I would just be a firefighter or do something like that, you know, get a job, do a little bit of schooling, get a job and maybe four days on four days off sounds pretty cool and playing with fire which i clearly still do um mm -hmm. but i just felt kept, I thought, you know i took this one watercolor class where the guy was a professional showing in galleries and was doing like photorealism in watercolor sort of the, the bay area in the bay area tradition kind of like robert bechtel i think he studied meant he was a studied under robert bechtel and uh so i thought it was super cool very inspiring like a cool guitar playing surfer guy and he just kind of took me under his wing in that class and then there's all these older folks in there too who were just like really into it and took the class all the time and they kind of knew his techniques and it was just the young guy around all these like really kind of inspiring older people and they they um kind of pushed me and all sort of promoted me trying to go to art school and so i just worked on that eventually and uh Moved to Los Angeles when I was 20 years old to try and go to Art Center. I hadn't gotten in, but I just started taking some night classes and trying to work a little bit. And uh, I got in and got some scholarship, and that was it. Started started kind of the change of my life. It, that was it. I was probably 21 by the time I got in. People were in that school, too, were a, like... Um, 
average entering age was 24 for freshmen at that college. So I was like oh. one of the young, young people and everybody was really good back then and, dri and you know, they're older. So they were driven, they were serious and it was just a really awesome environment for like developing my voice as an artist and sort of figuring out what I wanted to do. I was thinking I'd be an illustrator. I went to school for illustration. That's what I got my degree in. And I just trained to do that. But I ended up falling in love with the um, painting, oil painting, and just switched gears completely to thinking I'll do galleries and um, teach, you know, but I was thinking that'll be my long term goal when I'm like 50 years old. And hmm. I got both those things kind of thrown in my lap. When I graduated, I got offered a teaching job at this uh, Los Angeles Academy of Figurative Art. They were just opening. So they recruited a bunch of us that were graduating. And then I um, through that got in this gallery, I wanted to show it that all a bunch of guys that you probably know were showing there at the time this Morseburg gallery in, in Los Angeles, I think, probably Jeremy Lipking had his first solo show there and a bunch of those guys I met at the time. So it was cool because it was figurative gallery in Los Angeles. They sold stuff I did in school and it was just like, it was, it was awesome. Stuff just started rolling for me and the teaching was good. You know, I think when I started, I was offered $40 an hour, which was like, yeah, I'll take that. Sure. That was that like was 20 great. years ago though, um, right? 20 years. Yeah. Yeah. That's a lot of money. Yeah, so I'm like, sure. Yeah, and they even like had offered me good money for doing my, a day rate for workshops. So then it kind of set me up just to do that. And yeah, it was good, man. It was like getting out of school, like being able to just like teach a little bit. And like, I barely had any bills back then too. You know, I think I was living in a house with roommates and sharing the room with a girlfriend. So like I was paying probably $250 rent or something at the time. It was not hard to survive with, with a simple teaching job. And that kind of just got it going. And that's sort of what I've done now for 20 years. And, and I've just sort of, you know, dabbled in a lot of other things. And I still continue to do that. But that's sort of what, what, what the start was, I guess. So at, when you were at this school, was it kind of a traditional education? I mean, were they teaching you traditional skills, figure drawing and so on? Or was it more of a modern yeah, program? Yeah, so... No, because it was illustration, like, it was very rooted in like um the foundation studies like i th so it was they basically try and cram four years into three years by going to school year round so you do summer your summer semester was as long as the other ones and as important so we would just do eight terms basically and you get out and so a lot of people would just power through it because that was kind of where they were at in life some people would take summers off anyway and kind of extend their education um but i was training to be an illustrator and i just uh, you know it was uh the i would say the first four semesters was figure drawing figure painting color theory all the all the foundation stuff you need you know tons of design classes perspective classes rendering like rendering was a class that they got rid of eventually which is crazy to me because we had to basically learn how to render the crap out of anything in a, in acrylic oil and graphite mm. and like in graphite we we're using from like from like a uh, like a eight B to like a eight H or whatever, you know, like the whole range, and you have every gradation is made with a different pencil, and you know, like really hardcore kind of schooling, but but none of the sort of academic atelier style um, slow drawing. There was none of that. Like we drew and painted a lot, but our long poses for drawing were like twenty minutes, and our long poses for painting were like a one class, like five hours. Wow. We never taped off our easels and never went back to paintings. There was barely any indirect painting, but um, tons of a la prima and just quick sketch. But a lot of it. I mean, very so much that, like, you know, I think the education was thorough. So you think... Wasn't lacking that. And then... You weren't... Okay. So you think yeah, that, that the that, shorter you poses... Just focus on your work. Sorry, man. We got a little bit of a delay. So you think the shorter poses yeah, were enough to get the education that you needed? Well, I mean, we did. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't just short. I do find like the thing was that like, you know, you do one minute, all these gesture drawings, 30 seconds, whatever, then two minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes. But then you get to the point where you can do a really nice kind of fully shaded figure drawing in 20 minutes just do because of the training, you know, mm -hmm. I wouldn't say we didn't do drawings that were maybe an hour mm -hmm. in 20 minute increments, but 
for the most part, what I remember and what I taught was like long pose is 20 minutes. And if you kind of train people with one minute, two minute, you know, up to five minute drawings, by the time they're doing 10 and 20 minute drawings, they're kind of like not sure what else to do because they can kind of not get out. <laughs> yeah. But that, but I do find it important to be able to sit down and do something for weeks also. So I think there's always that balance, but we didn't do it. We didn't do, I didn't do one cast drawing. So I can't really imagine what it would be like to sit and do a cast drawing for 10 weeks. Yeah. I would be bored out of my mind and, 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 you know, but I think because we're training to be working illustrators, you know, you, you time is your money. So the faster you are, the more efficient you are, the more money you can make and the easier it is to survive. So it wasn't about like just painting as long as we felt like it was about getting jobs done for clients and um, doing them well, you know, and, and very, it's always quick. You know, there was times where I had to stay up all night painting full illustrations for classes because they kind of like just treated you the way you were probably going to be treated in the working world a little bit. And mm. So many all nighters when I was in school, I cannot do that now at this age, but mm -hmm. when I was in school, it was like all the time you didn't have a choice and you go to your critique in the morning, having not slept and, try and get it done. Hmm. There was one example I tell people was for my head drawing class. Um, the final project was a hundred heads and you had to take, there was like, I think 75 artists and then you, or I guess it would be, no, it would have been 25 artists. You do three drawings, copies and one in their style of a self and a self portrait. It was 25 artists. So the, so I, you know, like school's so busy. I had to do that whole project the night before it was due, hundred head drawings, and I did it. What? And like, and it was crazy. Holy but crap. like, I had in the morning. I had friends over at like seven a.m. helping me, and we had to mount them. They had to be all mounted. They weren't big, but there's still a hundred of them, and they're mounted on a board, all in like a big tiling. Jeez. So I had friends come over in the morning to help me mount them, and I went to class for the critique, and I got my grade. And never, I told that teacher years later, but. You know, that kind of training, I think, really helped me at least be quicker. How'd you do? How was the grade? Oh, I got an A, I'm sure. Nice. I took a bunch of classes. <laughs> that guy. I did well in school. I mean, I loved I loved going to art school. I, I, you know, it was like just what I wanted to do. And like, I didn't, I don't hate school. Even like when I had, we had a class called Letter Form where we had to hand paint letters and our, our sketches during the week were like, with a like a kind of wedge pencil like doing fonts and things and man i didn't i didn't want to do that i didn't care about it but doing it i liked it i loved i would sit in front and talk to the teacher all the time and just like i don't know i really loved being in art school and, and mm -hmm. in that environment you know people it was a real like there was a lot of working artists going like teaching there so it was kind of inspiring you know it wasn't just like a place where people come in who teach painting or whatever, you know, not that there's anything against that. I mean, I do a lot of that myself now, but that environment was very like competitive, but I don't feel like it was competitive in the way where people hated each other or whatever. It's more like just pushing each other to be better. Yeah. That sounds like, that sounds like a cool environment. So at what point when you were in school, did you recognize that the gallery option was available to you? Yeah. So like, because of the foundation classes, those teachers were like former illustrators, you know, I worked on some major movie posters and things like that, but they were mostly focusing on painting and they liked it and they had trained that way too, but now they were showing in galleries as their kind of, you know, what they were doing for business. So I started seeing like first, like falling in love with just the, the medium of oil paint and, and then through that, having teachers like going to some of my teachers shows and galleries and thinking, wow, this is like so cool. You know, it's like a fun gallery. They're selling art. They're doing art they want to do. And like that became very attractive to me to kind of have the control of that. And I really fell in love with doing portraiture. So I felt like I honestly thought like I, I would love to paint the president at some point. That was what I was thinking when I was in school, you know, do those types of portrait commissions. But I don't know if I'm the guy for those types of jobs at this point. Hmm. So that was sort of where I started just taking that path a little more and doing like large portraits. I think my last semester in school or last two semesters, I probably knocked out like maybe seven or eight, like full length life-size portraits and things. I was just like loving painting, you know, like going yeah. big, it's doing a lot of it. So what year was that? What, when, when you started uh, in the gallery, your last year of school, when you made that transition, what year was that? 2002. 
I started okay. showing a little bit when I was in school because I had some connections, you know, like, so like I did show, uh, sell some stuff in galleries, like in that when I was in school, you know, I don't know, 2000 around then 2001. And like, it's just like stuff I did out of my head and they sold easily. And I was just like starting to get a taste for like the gallery thing. And I was like, seriously, I painted that thing. I made up this like, I don't remember what the painting was, but it's kind of like invented out of my head because I was really more confident back then about inventing things, I guess. And, you know, it was a couple hours of just playing around with the painting. I think I just did like a Christ-like figure. And then, you know, they sold it for 800 bucks. I'm like, it was really easy money and fun. You know, like mm -hmm. I like this as, a, as, a, as an option for a career. I don't have to jump out of a burning building saving people. <laughs> and so, yeah, like that just, it just kind of like everything fell into place. I mean, I think I had, I had a lot of connections built up through school because my teachers really kind of respected me and my work. And then I, um, I don't know, the economy was good probably back then, really good for painting. There was no social media distractions. There was hardly use of the internet. You know, galleries were working hard, I think, back then and doing and like the so I, I showed at that Morseburg gallery and it was it was good. You know, they sold a lot of stuff I did in school and like even some of the big ones I remember he sold for like ten grand and I'm thinking, What? Like this is oh, like you my must have been final cloud project nine. making me money. Yeah, it was great. It was like easy. It was like so fun and and like there was a demand. You know, I was kinda like at that gallery I was sort of looked at as maybe a little bit on the outside and edgy, but he was still able to sell my work. And mm -hmm. there's a few pieces I had in there that became kind of like well-known pieces for me that he had the opportunity to sell for very cheap, but just the clientele wasn't like ready for seeing some guy with tattoos and whatever mm -hmm. coming through there. And, hmm. and then I, through those galleries kind of, kind of became, then they sort of wanted that like, more tattooed girl paintings. I'm like, whoa, whoa, I get to say what I paint. <laughs> no, thanks. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a trip yeah. talking to you about this. Cause I, I had, I didn't realize we were literally on the same year. My, my final year of college was also 2002. And I also started galleries in okay. 2002, but I remember back then, I don't know if it's just because those were the years that I started, but it felt like this, uh, I don't know, this like really high point in the art world and not a high point, but an exciting time. Let me put it that way. It was an exciting time. It was exciting. Yeah. And, um, I mm -hmm. remember watching your work in the magazines and, and just being like, oh man, this guy's freaking insane, you know? And it was, and watching you kind of Thanks. rise up while I was trying to make a career for myself at the same time. I didn't realize it was literally right on the same year we both started. That's it. That's yeah. kind of cool. Yeah. I think I, I, I learned that about you from listening to you talk to Joseph to Dorvich because I was like, oh man, we all really did kind of just come out at the same time. And a bunch of those guys ended up at that gallery I was at. And I think we all had a blog probably back then. So yeah. that's how we knew about <laughs> yeah. each other or something. <laughs> yeah, it's true. <laughs> Mine's still out there somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Every yeah, now and then funny. mine pops I, up. I definitely remember your work. Oh, yeah. That's funny. I haven't looked at mine for years. Well, every now and then someone will comment. I'll get an email. Like someone comment on my WordPress oh, blog. Wait, I'm wait, like, yeah. what? That's still out there? <laughs> like people actually read this thing? It's funny. It's funny. Yeah, man, those were good. That was I love those times like that. There was very few people you had access to seeing or, or, you know, you had to look in magazines and then there's a few galleries or whatever. And then a few of us, I guess, started blogs and kind of knew of each other. But, you know, there's a handful of guys in, in sort of our range, age range, I think, that yeah, came yeah. out during that time. And it was, it was cool. It was good. Can't believe it's been so long. I know, man. 20 years. It's mind-blowing. So, all right. So, I want to uh, – it's going to be – interesting trying to figure out how to balance all this stuff because like we talked about earlier you have lots of hobbies but so we're going to come back to painting i'm going to talk about yeah. i want to talk about distraction <laughs> and uh and other hobbies you know because i feel yeah. like um you and i are sort of uh sort of uh, similar in this way we both have a lot of hobbies mm -hmm. outside of painting i don't know yeah. if yours have become lucrative at all mine mine aren't mine's just painting but um yeah. but i definitely admire everything that you're doing it's freaking mind-blowing but how did you so you're Thanks. teaching and you're painting how did you make that shift into chess sets and knives and and engraving and all this other stuff you got your hands in how did you even find the time? Yeah. Oh my gosh. I don't know if I found the time. Maybe I've 
just made the time. I wish days were twice as long. That would be Same. nice. Or we didn't have to sleep or something. Especially nowadays, I don't sleep very well. But I've always kind of dabbled. Like, so, again, I grew up with a father who was a jeweler, so I've been around it. You know, unfortunately, I didn't take advantage of it, the interest I have now, you know, at the time before he retired and sold everything. But um, my uncle also, my mom's brother, he was, he's a general contractor, and I grew up kind of having to work for him and just doing manual labor. So I always liked working with my hands and learned a lot from him just about, you know, one, I remember we used to build these check cashing centers and I had to spend like eight hours drilling holes in bulletproof steel for him. And it's just like those types of things that like I'm drilling steel all day now. And, and uh, so we even like dabbled in his shop in his garage, like trying to make like we tried to make swords when I was a teenager. Didn't know anything about like carbon steel or whatever we were doing. We just got mild steel and started grinding and cutting, you know, using whatever <laughs> tools he had available that we could. So he made a really sweet, huge broadsword, you know, and, and I kind of never got around to finishing mine or getting close to it. Out of mild also steel. dabbled in like, yeah, just like, <laughs> That's he a still has it somewhere. Yeah, just like a big prop, basically. But I'm sure it could do some damage. But um, and then I remember I used to go to the Renaissance Fair and liked that kind of stuff. I always loved this. I had this fascination. I guess a lot of boys have fascinations with arms and armor and stuff. And. But I used to go to Renaissance Fair and check that out, and I would like check out the guys who were, you know, blacksmithing or making chainmail. Or I was just always attracted to it. Oh, I, as a teenager, got some brochure to go to this jousting camp in some other part of the country. I don't remember where it was, but you know, I had to mail in and get a brochure, little paper pamphlet, and <laughs> was trying to go to jousting school. Are you <laughs> so serious? I had this weird interest in it. Yeah, yeah, just like I don't know what I was thinking. Um, just wanted to like ride a horse really fast and knock people off of theirs or something <laughs> sounded fun <laughs> um yeah so man i don't even know where i was headed with that but i just always dabbled in it so we made some like chain mail like we saw the guys make made it had a crank at the renaissance fair for making chain mail and they take wire and do it so we built this whole crank me and my brother and my uncle then we started making the links and cutting and we started making chain mail so we did a lot of that my dad had a friend who was a sheet metal worker. I tried making like a crusader helmet with him at his shop. And and, you know, and so this is at of, what age? Little, teenager? This is like teenager. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Between like 15, 17. Before I decided to jump into art, I had been doing this, just like dabbling in it. Before I decided to jump into painting and go to school. And then, um, you know, years later, I think I was in uh, Sweden with family and we were trying to buy a gift for my former brother-in-law and the family had a friend who was a knife maker. So we went to go visit his shop and buy a little knife for the brother. And that made me kind of interested in it again, where I saw the gear he had, which was so minimal, tiny forge, probably making, I think he's making knives out of files, old files. And so I'm like, I could do that. You know, it's like, this is cool. And I don't know. I think I was just, you know, that was probably 20, 15 or so I just started looking stuff up and found a blacksmithing school in LA went went right home and I was just like I just like after going to that guy's shop I was obsessed with doing this and learning it and I started looking at Bowie knives and I started finding all these makers and went took a class in blacksmithing and man it was so fun I had a had an excellent teacher who just like I don't know he was just so good at teaching that it, it was very easy he's like you've never done this before I'm like you're just telling us exactly how to do it and I can pay attention Mm -hmm. And uh, we made barn hooks, and man, that was it. And then I just started studying with that guy and making knives. They had an open open forge time, so I could go there for like three hours and just hammer out stuff. And so finding the time, I was full-time teaching at, at that point. You know, I might have even been teaching. There was a point where I was teaching like seven classes a week at like five different schools. And I was oh jumping gosh. all over every day somewhere else in traffic. There was my one long day I had a class from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m., a class from 2 to 7 and at one school. And then at 7.30, I had a night class at a different school. So I had to clean up all my paints, drive to the other school, and I made the class 7.30 so I could just, like, actually get there. So during that time, you know, some nights I'd be like, okay, I'm going to go to the forge tonight or I'm going to work in the shop or I was also playing hockey three, four times a week. So I had to save nights for games because I was in some leagues and, and pickups. And then I was traveling every two weeks to see my son. 
and I was doing one once a month workshop. So I was, so I was on a plane. I was on round trip flights three times a month minimum, living out of a suitcase, playing hockey, working a full time job, and then I found the blacksmithing and I made a lot of time for that. And just it was cool because with the teaching, like you know, you get paid and you're doing tons of painting. But I didn't want to paint when I got home, so it wasn't like it was a struggle. I was making enough of a regular salary and with the i was also doing some private teaching for like hollywood folks so that was like priority because they paid me super well and that was like three times a week sometimes so i was just like so busy for many years and so much living out of a suitcase but i made time because i wanted it and i and i i painting had become such a job for me that like i didn't have like I still look at it every day. I still like doing it, but I wasn't doing it in my free time. I didn't care to. I did so much of it for work that I didn't do it in my free time. So I needed a new hobby and that was the hobby on top of, I mean, I didn't even mention that I also play music and had a band and everything. And I still do that every day, but I barely talk about it. So, um, there's just a lot. And, and during, it was a pandemic, I think really opened up more time for me because I couldn't travel anymore. I was at that point I was burning out. I was like wanting to see my son more. So I started, I quit teaching the full-time job because I, I just couldn't, I'd go to these workshops, you know, like in Europe or wherever, and then have this amazing experience. The students have this great enlightening experience and I'm getting really positive feedback. And then, and classes are selling out. And then I go back to art center to teach these full-time kids and they're just on their phones and like, you know, they're paying yeah. so much money. And I'm doing more demos for them. And it just started to feel like I was, even though I was getting paid really well, and it was like a 15 hour week commitment for a full-time salary at that school, which was amazing. I just, it wasn't worth it. Mm. I miss it a little bit. I miss the salary and the benefits, but I don't, I don't miss the environment of like forcing people to like, like art. Hmm. And then, and then you got to punish them because I got that school. It's like, you got to take attendance and it all matters. And you got to take role and you got to make sure they're they're on break after break and they're doing all their work. And it's like, if they don't want to do it, I hate Aren't they grown to ups? It. This sounds like you're teaching kindergarten. Well, so after I told you when I started, it was like 24 was the average age. When I was teaching there, the average age ended, ended up started starting to be like right out of high school. So mm. They weren't serious. And then because that school is so expensive now, it's like uh, when I left, it was probably 22000 a semester. And like I said, they do that three times a year. So you're talking, you know, like Ivy Jeez. League tuition to be an artist. That's insane. You know, like, so let's say you do that for three years and that's just tuition. You know, there's a lot of supplies involved with art and computer fees and living in California, another huge fee. So oh, these kids are going to like start a career with a quarter million dollars debt minimum or something like that's crazy. It doesn't, yeah. it doesn't compute. No. It's not the right job for it, you know? Mm -mm. Yeah, that's crazy. And so it's that was part of why up. I got out. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and when I was there, it was hard to get in. Like I had a, I have some work that I show now, some of those watercolors that people are like, what the hell is that? That's not a photograph. And like, I know that's, you know, that was like, oh, that photo realism is annoying sometimes in which people say it looks like a photograph, but like I was told when I showed those that I wasn't good enough to get into the school, you know, at, the, at back then. And nowadays, like people buy portfolios, uh, you know, there's that whole, there's a whole business of that, like keep getting people to make portfolios for you. The school ended up having to be more rich people because of the cost. And so the quality goes down. They're like, keep them in school to take their money, you know, you don't have to be as, you don't have to grade as hard. And so the whole, the whole thing I think is just what the school environments are like nowadays, you know, as the students get younger, there's a different, different, there's, there's a different mentality in schools and life in general right now that I think is fine and relevant to what's going on. But I just, for me and my brain, it was, it was too much to waste my time on. Hmm. And so, yeah. So I don't know. Pandemic forced me to like stay home. I, 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 I was like, okay, I'm, I'm working from home again. I'm, I'm used to teaching, but I'm not, I'm used to teaching in person with live models. I never have done like over the computer. So I, so I kind of didn't, didn't kind of latch onto that during the pandemic. I just kind of stopped teaching and I would do a few selective workshops when people wanted to do them, but I just was able to focus a little more on my metal work and, um, 
spend a lot of time with my son when he was doing his homeschooling. Like, that was great. I was like, oh, man, I don't want you to go back to school. Yeah. It was fun. You know, we were skateboarding, we were playing some roller hockey on break, you know, out there or whatever, building stuff, making all kinds of stuff, just projects. Um, so it was awesome. And then as far as engraving goes, it was during that same time, like I was kind of contacting people to, to engrave my knives for me to see if, you know, they would do that because I didn't think about starting a whole new craft. But then one of my buddies I've collected knives from and I, and I chat with a lot, he, um, he bought a whole engraving setup from this company that makes, they're kind of the main one out there. And, uh, but he, something else happened where he got a job do, and, he, and needed to get a sewing machine instead of the engraving setup. So he wanted to sell it. And I was like, okay. I mean, I was like, I got all this time right now, you know, I've got enough of a, you know, I could afford to buy it and it wasn't too expensive. And I was like, I'm just gonna buy it. Sure. Why not? More gear. I love gear. I know you do too. <laughs> yeah. I got, I still got things in boxes I've never used before, but, um, and then I, so I set it up and tried it, man, it was so hard. I was very discouraged, but also like, I wasn't going to let it stop me. And so I had to buy more gear because then I realized, well, if you really like the guys that work that I like, they're using microscopes. So then, it, and you can't just buy a cheap microscope. You got to have a nice microscope with good lenses and those are very expensive. But I, you know, I found some stuff on eBay and got good deals through some bidding, but, and I got the setup going and, and I have since upgraded to like top of the line machine and everything. And man, I'm, in, I'm obsessed and I love it. And it's what I'm looking at every day now. I think with engraving, it was really cool because you know, I'm doing drawing, painting, then metal work and they're not related, but then I start drawing on metal and it's like all coming back together. And now I'm spending all this time learning how to design scrolls and acanthus leaves. And, you know, it's like, it's, I'm back to like being that student that I love being and, and learning something and sucking at it and trying to get better and, and hating what I'm doing. And, and it's been super fun mm. and just seeing it, you know, getting good responses some, with some of it and starting to see some results and feeling more, way more comfortable with the tools. So right now, you know, I think I, I've realized I've put so much time and energy into all this stuff that I need to get back to teaching and painting a little bit, because like you, it is my main money maker. I didn't want the metal work to be, something that made money because it made my relationship to painting different. And I don't want that with the metal work. But on the other hand, I want to do metal work every day. So if I have, if I'm going to do it every day, I have to start thinking about making money with it. Right. And I had, and then I have like the chess set you mentioned, like that was just something that like, because of the metal work and because of the connections I had, I got asked if I would do, and I didn't even question it. I didn't even play chess. I don't even know the first move. And, but I was like, yeah, I'm going to figure it out. So I started studying chess and yeah. So that was my first, um, I had to make samples of each. Just, they started off as a drawing. I don't know if I sent that to you, but there's like, basically I, I, I liked the classic profile of like some of those Staunton chess pieces, you know, yeah. I don't know if it's like, um, but I wanted it to kind of, work with how I built my knives and how I, how I liked to cut, you know, cut things and combine colors or whatever. So this was the first sample set to, after the drawings to kind of see how to make them first of all, because I, I had never, I had used a wood lathe in school because that was part of the great part of education where we had also had that kind of uh, stuff going on. But I had to basically buy a mini lathe, learn how to use it, figure out chess pieces and what the weighting and the sizing is that people like is and how the relationship to the board squares is and all that. And I went for like, I think I went for some sort of fitting in between like ter actual tournament sizes. So they're pretty big. I mean, like the King's over four, four inches tall. Wow. But so those are basically all bronze and African blackwood for the body, which I love for knife handles. I made them all on a lathe for the most part, even the cross, like that was done on a lathe where I left I made like a, a cross that wasn't flat. It was like, right, like a disc. Cutting to, yeah. And then I like a, like a UFO or something. And then I just cut it. I'm just, so it could be one piece and everything's threaded and screws together. So it's, those things are built. They're solid. They're on like quarter 20 threading. So they're like, they're just like tanks in there. And that, and that African blackwood is insane. Yeah. The blackwood um, almost looks like metal. It's so polished. Yeah. Yeah. And that there's no oil in there. Nothing. That's just straight off the lathe. You know, you can kind of like, if you go through your grits, that wood has no grain present and it, it'll buff to just a beautiful finish. It's incredible. 
Do you stabilize so, it or anything? You don't. You can't. No, no, it's too dense. Get in there. You don't have to. Mm. Yeah, you don't have to stabilize it. Yeah, Man. you know it's weird. I live in a place that's super dry, so I'm experiencing a lot of problems with some wood, but that stuff holds up pretty good. It's similar to like I work with uh, ironwood a lot. I love that one too. And I mean, it's kind of like ebony, but I feel like ebony is slightly more brittle. It like more chips out more, but it you know polishes really nice. And I do feel like blackwood almost feels heavier for some reason, even though ebony is pretty heavy. Hmm. There's just something about it, man. It's like it's like made for using in as knife handles or tool handles or whatever. It's just such a beautiful dark wood. I got to give that a try. Um, that wood a try with something. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's hard to find now because it's like in the rosewood family. I think it's becoming kind of an illegal import, mm. or just like you know, it's not going to happen soon. But it, check check like Bell Forest. They sell like big. I, I buy like the kind of for this. I had to buy a bunch of big chunks from them, like the two two by two. And maybe like eighteen inches long, hmm. but yeah, so, it's 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 awesome. How about the horse or the knight? Yeah, you so know? that was yeah. So the knight, man, that so that became an issue because you know that's the only one you can't make on the lathe as easily, and then it's all hand carved. You know, that's just carved. So I basically on the lathe I did the base. And I had the top as a block that would make sure, and I drew the profile to make sure I could fit. I drew a front probably and a profile just to get the kind of curve so you can kind of grind. You know, you still kind of have sharp corners, but if you grind the profile first, cut it very carefully, then on the other side, you kind of give another cut. Then you just round the corners, essentially. It's more, it's a little harder work than that. But I use rasps and, you know, blades and dremels type stuff and, um, and then the bronze mane, I basically like cut a channel in the back. Oh, after the I mane is bronze. It. Get out it's of town. Bronze. Yeah, you can't see in that picture. It was, Holy cow! Added another one. Yeah, and it's so, hard like, to see, I but I see it, it now. There. Yeah. So, but you know, I ended up. I don't know if there's a picture of the finish set. I changed the horse design completely. Yeah. Let me let me look for, here. You've for got two like reasons. You've got this. Is that maple? Yeah, so that's the white team. It's a synthetic ivory that I really like how it looks because I was going to use, there's a lot of options, but I needed, I had this like Hollywood and I stable, had it stabilized and it was just a little too light like because the, the blackwood's so heavy that I needed something that, that weighed a little more. So I bought this like synthetic ivory that had pretty good uh reviews and stuff and tried it and man it worked beautifully i think it's pretty and i'm going to use some for knife handles because out in california ivory is illegal all ivory whether it's ancient or not right i thought about like you know it'd be cool to have some mammoth ivory pieces or i thought about doing like going to carrara when i'm in italy and just getting some marble and trying to like like why could i, mean, I can work metal i'm pretty sure marble is not as hard as metal hmm what about um, bone? I, I just stuck with these yeah, that'd be cool too. Just so many different sizes. Yeah, like you could definitely like I use stabilized giraffe bone a lot for knife handles now, and I like those. Yeah, so these were done. These are you know kind of the final. Those were the final. I had to deliver it for Christmas, and like I was putting in like sixteen hour days at the end trying to knock it out because you can even see one of them like the the felt pads. You know, like I had to make cutting tools. I basically bought pipes on the lathe that were within the kind of size I needed. Multiple mm -hmm. steel pipes. And then on the lathe, I'd cut them in, I'd like kind of shape them into like a punch. And then I bought, you know, a bunch of felt. So each one has custom felt on the bottom. Did you I'm actually like, oh, harden it or did you use mild steel? For the punch. the punch? No, it was just, no, it was just mild. And it yeah, was, it, it held its edge it enough. Cutting board. Okay. Yeah. I, yeah. 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 Easy to sharpen it back up. But yeah, just hammer them right through that felt. Hmm. Um, yeah, so like, you know, a lot of problem solving. It was fun. Major problem solving um, project. Dude. Yeah, and I, I, you know, I got small one. But yeah, so I never actually have, I haven't gotten like the full, like any nice pictures of it yet. And with, with the board, I had a board that I had some, I designed and had some friends help me make. And like, it, it sort of like started coming apart. And so I don't know what happened. So I, I had to do that over with other people and, um, that's sitting here right now. So I still got to bring it back because this was basically for last Christmas. But now I'm also working on a storage box and my buddy, you know, we, we um, measured everything carefully, made a 3D printed 
tray insert that they all sit in with a little logo of each like the pawn is a circle and then like the mm. crown shape you know like all like imprinted in this and i'm going to flock it with like red suede to look like the the base of the oh thing. man so, still got a little ways so i switched so the the i'm like getting down to the wire and thinking man i don't want to carve those horses and it's just something about it that like the the client wanted it she's really into like kind of modern clean designy stuff and everything she showed me with oh, the horses simple so i was like i really want to do like almost like an art deco horse you know i kind wish you like had a better shot straight. of that i know I oh you do I right had, here right I here thought they were there. okay yeah i just wanted to, because i didn't get to take pictures and had to deliver so i went for this art deco theme and i kind of think it looks cool it know? is I cool it to be more personal it was still hard i'm like trying to, i had to carve those four like in the last two days and inlay the bronze thing and man it was dude I this like stuff in a way is harder than realism because you got to get perfect symmetry perfect planes yeah so smooth there's planes there's not like all the bumps can't right. get away with just like some gesture i i started to think well maybe what i'll do is i'll just have them all pose different like energy like one head turned what like one head down and just so i don't have to worry about the exact perfection this was a i had to basically do a drawing very careful drawings with everything measured and then every cut or grind i did was like done with I, some sort of jig where i'm like i can repeat things and so i like cut the profile cut this you know cut cut the you know whatever and then and then everything gets blended at the end but i use a lot of kind of planning to make sure everything has the same shape from the profile then from the front it has the same curve on the lathe and then you got to get down oh, man but you so you turned it on the lathe and probably had just this probably had this plane go all like, the way around right the nose plane yeah basically and it was yeah i turned it just to the base of the nose and then the rest and then i think i, I you know, looked at the profile and i found a wheel on my grinder to carve into the profile just to get the, to a consistent curve but it was hard to blend a lot of that that's what i was going to ask you how did you Especially, blend that that is just, yeah, nuts. files, rasps, sandpaper. On the blackwood, it was harder because that stuff is so hard and getting in those tiny little areas. Like it holds, which is nice, but it was just hard to smooth it out. Like you can see it when it doesn't gradate smoothly, you know? Mm -hmm. So it was just kind of like, I think I probably even like, I don't know, maybe went back on the lathe after to clean it up. But I don't know. Anyway, it was tricky and I, and I like how it came out. I liked, I think she was happy with, with that, those knights being you know that design it fit her aesthetic i think better and i and i was glad that i got to design something totally fresh you know yeah i, I think it was a great move although i would love to see it, you finish the chess set with a traditional too all totally. right so let's look and at some of your engraving doing it for myself yeah cool so this is actually part of a one of my only knife commissions and um I've taken a few here and there, but as you know, knives take a long time to make, and I'm sure you can knock out a portrait painting in a much faster time that someone's yeah, willing to Yeah, and get pay paid more. And 10 times the amount or more, you know? Like yeah. People aren't even willing to pay for knives, mostly like what I get for my class studies, you know, like just mm -hmm. the way it's been. So I think because they don't think of it as art, they think of it as a tool and like, yeah, well, if you want to go buy a tool, I'll... I'll send you a link to the Home Depot website and you can go buy a tool for a nice right. price. Um, so yeah, but so this one's actually for a big commit. One of my collectors, a regular one, of my, my, probably my best collector I've had, and he's just very supportive and, and regular and, you know, always commissioning me. And, and I just knew we've talked a lot about his father because his father used to collect um, like kind of knives and guns. So we've kind of always sort of talked about maybe that being a possibility or, you know, some of the paintings he's bought of mine are more like the Western ones and fit that vibe. So he has a painting. I did uh, a self portrait. We'll probably see it later where I'm just wearing like a cowboy hat and my hands are down in front. Um, and that, I called that painting the boss of the plains because that was the, the, the name of that hat that stetson first made like when he was kind of i think he came from a hat making family but he was doing like the american west stuff in, in the plains and realizing everybody needed a bigger brim so he made this first hat like in a pot or over a campfire and then they became like the first cowboy hat was the boss of the plains and what they marketed it as so that stetson i'm wearing in that is like that shape um so he wanted a painting or a knife that maybe would be themed with the boss of the plains and that's where this piece came in so i'm just thinking of a cool fancy bowie knife you know and 
did a bunch of drawings and came up with some designs. And I even drew the engraving as part of it. But now that I've kind of built the knife, I have the engraving has had to change because three dimensional surfaces are way different than like the 2D drawing. And, and I'm just kind of engraving on the fly. So this is just the guard for it. And pretty much, I think 100% of that engraving is drawn directly onto the metal without a, without, I'll design it like I'll, on the iPad, maybe just to see how it looks. But this is just done purely on metal where I use like dividers to create borders, you know, like our calipers or whatever. And then I use the same dividers to kind of line out the, like everything's just a pattern of some sort. And then a series of cuts, repetitive cuts. I mean, maybe not like the banner on the side and those leaves, but like the repetitive leaf shapes, you know, you kind of like mark everything off and then you do like one big curve cut, curve, and then you cut the, you go along and do the edges and then you do all the shading. Well, for the circles, you know, I kind of like scribe a circle inside that circle and then I divide it into like a pie of pieces and then you just like, do, you know, and then another division and then you do these cuts. You do all your left hand cuts, all your right hand cuts. And mm. it's kind of fun and meditative, you know. I love seeing it come together. This has a little bit of Sharpie in it right now. I just use a little quick marker because you, you ink engraving or if you do like a patina, the darkness will stay inside the, the cuts. Mm -hmm. Um but it's just easier to see at every angle. You know, you don't have to ink it, but right. it's easier to see when there's glare and stuff. So that has the Sharpie right now. So when you're drawing on so it, that was, are you inking? Are you, are yeah. you dyeing? You're like using that blue dye and kind of carving through? No, 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 you could probably for borders, but no, I'm using, uh, you just use like a scribe and you see it very lightly. Well, I guess it is a soft metal. It is bronze or yeah, brass but even on even even on steel i will i'll still use a scribe for the mm. most part like that's that's generally how people draw on the metal if you're not just going to draw it on your device and transfer it with like acetone or whatever which works as well but you'd have to get your shapes exactly right for something like that and it's just lining it up so small would be crazy um but for certain things i definitely do that but you, there's also like ways of taking a pattern where you take a piece of tape, put it on the shape, rub pencil on the edges to get the exact pattern, put that on your on a piece of paper and scan it. You have a 3D version exactly the size of your thing. Blow it up, draw it, print it back out the same original size, and it sh it'll fit exactly on your piece. Oh, that's smart. I like that. Yeah, just using like, I mean, if it's too like rounded, it's if it's just a rounded tube super easy to take a pattern off of but like and, and you can take like let's say I, I still have to do the other side of that guard so if i want to repeat that pattern with the banner i can there's different ways different types of things you can rub into it one of them that i just learned that i'm going to use probably is like chapstick mixed with graphite powder hmm and you basically rub it into the cuts wipe off the surface put a piece of clear tape on it and you lift it and it lifts all the lines and then you can see through it so you can line it up on the other side because it, i need to reverse it i would put the two pieces two pieces of tape together and pull it off onto the other side then put that on and then you can see it lines it up perfectly and then you clean it up with scribes a little bit so that you can wipe off some of the junk but cool ways of like transferring on metal and 3d surfaces yeah that's freaking awesome so all right so i just like learning that one. stuff yeah, I bet. Yes. With this particular one, do you have the finished knife or just the guard? Did you? I'm not that? even done. With, I don't know. There's a couple pictures. Probably to the right there. There's a picture. Not that one. Keep going. Probably right next to no. It, there's one. It's like a, it's got an ivory looking handle and um. Okay. With the bronze pieces and there and I'm pretty sure I had a picture of me holding the full blade, but. Yeah, I don't know. I, I bet they all it. got out of order. Oh, here it is. Put them in. That's that, so. That's so. There, I haven't done the other side of the guard, but I I engraved the spine of the blade, and that was after the steel was hardened. Um, it wasn't as hard on the spine because I did use some clay to heat treat it, but um, it was a significant jump up from the brass cut. Trying to cut that on that core, it's a quarter inch thick, probably that spine. So. Hmm. I basically drew that one on a, on the iPad and printed it because it's really simple to to place down the transfer. Yeah, when I saw this one on Instagram and saw El Jefe, I was hoping you were sending it to me, but I don't think that's happening. I know it's funny, <laughs> it's, and we were talking the day I cut it too, and I just kept seeing it as Jeff because the E wasn't like reading as well. 
and uh yeah so el jefe would be like the boss you know it's yeah the, i just thought like if it said the boss i can't stand when people call each other boss or like hey boss thanks boss like don't call me boss i'm not your boss um so i didn't want to just say boss because i have a thing with boss <laughs> and i thought it'd be kind of cool to put it in spanish it just looks cooler in spanish yeah it does it like looks rad so this palette knife so I got is a ways freaking to go. insane Thanks. Yeah, you know, I figured after a little bit of blacksmithing knives that I should probably be doing some pallet knives. And um, yeah, so that one I haven't built a handle yet. I just, it's just like, yeah, that was kind of like people to show like how thin you have to actually forge, grind, and yeah, that's incredible make something to 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 actually be flexible. And it's got that pattern on it too. But you know, pallet knives that have Damascus pattern aren't really um, a good idea. It's more of a it's more of a like artistic gimmicky thing. Like it works as a knife, but like it leaves a pattern. Right, like, it's etched, so it's not even smooth. Pattern. It's etched. It's got a so uh, you can get the pattern to show with just copy and no te like, and it'll it'll show the colors of the steel, but won't give the texture. So for a oh. usable palette knife, I'd probably do that. But you know, also I think well, this is a one of a kind piece. It's got it's, it's got a unique fingerprint too. You know, it's got it's, it's mm -hmm. it is what it is. It's not the one you use. It wouldn't be the one you clean up with every day. I don't think it'd be silly, but it, it works as one. So how in the world so, do you know, grind so thin? I mean, how do you grind it parallel? The two sides parallel that thin? I don't know. I just carefully, I guess. Just by but eye. You got to heat treat it when it's thicker. Just by eye. Yeah. Yeah, Holy I mean, moly. I don't on that one. I don't. Yeah, because I forged it. There's a picture of me forging, I think. And that was I was forging that blade out. Is that this um, one? Yeah, that's yeah, it right so there. You can yeah. kind of see the shape of it, how I'm just kind of hammering it out. You know, the, the stem has to be only about two inches long. I on It's like a one inch, you know, going across and then a one inch down at an angle. So my anvil is wider than that. So it's a little tricky, like getting the stem. I have to go off the corner or off the horn. Or use like some sort of like guillotine type of hammering press, but yeah, I just basically I'll have like Damascus cutoffs from like a knife or whatever, and that's enough steel to hammer into that shape. Hmm. Well, I have. Make, I should make more. Yeah, it's freaking awesome. I have lots of technical questions, but I'm going to reserve them for out, off of the podcast because I know it's getting a. Yeah. It might be a little too too uh, specialized. Um. I definitely lose followers sometimes when I post too many knife things. Isn't that funny? But People are so knives. temperamental on Instagram. Yeah, I mean, I get why they're there for the most part. Now I've got a little of both, but it's funny when I've had people like be scared of the fact that I make knives. I'm like, do you not know, like, <laughs> use a knife every day in your kitchen? Like, it's just one of man's oldest tools behind like a, a dull night like a rock yeah you mean next, you're not a serial killer tool, is that what you're like saying a sharp rock yeah yeah <laughs> or you don't just cook food yeah that's what they think i guess <laughs> i had somebody say they were scared to take a workshop with me because of it are you serious yeah that's another and i have so many in progress pieces that one was done more recently sometimes i'll buy damascus from people so that was a bar of steel i bought from somebody and then i did a little bit of forging to try and manipulate the pattern into the blade shape um hmm. And I do all the heat treating and grinding, but and then I did I that guard I ended up gra engraving and it's got a curve to it. There's probably pictures of that one. Uh, let's finished. see here. Yeah, I guess if they got out of order, yeah, it's like they get out of order. But also, I have so many unfinished projects. Yeah, so that's I, that was actually a commission. That, Which that one? This one here. Knife. Yeah, and then the, with the red background it is okay. Like, is with the sheath. Yeah, and this one yeah, you left so that, kind I of hammered knives like that. Yeah, I love like you leaving the forge finish if I can. Uh, I tried to leave a little more, but that has a blackwood handle, it's domed, domed pins, maybe nickel silver. I don't remember. And I did the leather work too, all from scratch, like with just raw, raw leather and cut it, made a pattern, cut, dyed, stamped it, stitched it, hand stitched everything. Yeah, Do man, it's beautiful. Polishing, but yeah, that. Thanks. So I like making those like kind of simple knives that are for use you know there's still yeah. like a lot of ton of hours into like polishing and shaping and making everything symmetrical but it's not like building the guard and engraving it and all that stuff where it becomes like just an insane amount of work yeah like something like that i could you know spend a solid week doing especially even with the sheath you know it's still a few days of trying to like get that sheath together by hand 
yeah. just waiting for things to dry or whatever. I know it's amazing how long just too. this like after, takes. And that's no engraving, no yeah, anything. Like even just a simple blade. Yeah. No guard, no spacers, no like like some of the ones I build the whole thing screws together from the, the pommel nut or whatever. But like yeah, it's something when it's simple, I guess things stand out too. So you gotta spend more time cleaning up the simple parts that yeah. are kind of flat and smooth and but yeah, I'll, I chopped a ton of wood with it before I finished put on the handle. I sliced tomatoes. I beat it up. I'll chop an antler just to make sure, even with the chef knife sometimes. We can't take that abuse, and I don't want it going out there. Right, right. So, all right. So how just, do you define yourself as an artist? I mean, to me, this is all art. These are all just art mediums, you know? But how do how do you mm -hmm. define yourself? Are you a painter? Definitely. Are you a craftsman? Are you a knife maker? Are you a metal worker? What how do you define yourself? I mean, yeah, I mean, I guess that I would just go with a general art artist or maker of some sort, I suppose. But like, I've called myself a painter for many, many years, you know, I would say like, in 20 years of career that this is just the last seven, five to seven, you know, and, and really intensely the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, I, I make all kinds of stuff. I like making stuff, you know, I'm spending, I'm probably the last year have spent a, as much time painting as I have in the shop on a, doing other things, just trying to balance it out. But I also had a little more control of my career because I was doing freelance and, you know, not sharing my money as much, but I didn't put my focus into painting this last year. And it definitely, I think, affected my career, but that was also like what did I think was going to happen, you know, when I stopped right, right. making a bunch of paintings. Um, you know, I just kind of backed out of doing gallery stuff and, and the, the teaching too, which was teaching has been something that's been with me a long time. Um, but I'm starting to get back into doing, I'm trying doing Zoom classes and things now to, to help people with their work. Mm -hmm. Just because it's something, I, I, it's something I've done so long, it feels like I'm wasting it, just not using it and, and not, you know, I like helping people. I like, I like kind of people seeing people like seeing their eyes open to things in, in such sim in simple ways. You know, to me, that's one of the greatest parts about teaching. Like I would hope I could teach somebody like one time and they got everything like that'd be amazing. It was, it was never about me like <laughs> yeah. making the money and bring, bringing people back over and over just to kind of keep a regular paycheck. Like I love getting results. Mm hmm. Yeah, that's really fulfilling, teaching and seeing people yeah. get really good. Okay, so let's talk about your painting yeah, I love now. It. So this painting here, yeah. let's see the date, 2004, I knew it. Yeah, this is one of the first yeah. early ones that I remember seeing in magazines and just being just completely enamored with your, your yeah, skill. Yeah, this one, it kind of like, this one really was like, a, I guess a turning point for me. And I didn't know it was. It was just part of, uh, at the time, I was just painting my friends, painting all the friends I knew from school and my community in LA, California, wherever, Pasadena. And I thought, you know, if I'm going to be painting portraits, I'm just going to, I'm not going to hire people. I'm just going to paint the people around me that are my friends I hang out with all the time and just sort of document that part of my life. And, um, but, you know, she's very interesting looking and, and edgy, you know, was what people would call her. And it's a little eight by ten inch painting. Part oh, of I did that all small? eight by ten inch paintings back then. Yeah, it's real small. I still own it. It's the one I've kept because it it was like so. I submitted it for the BP award that year. It's like oh five, I think, um, mm -hmm. because of just the logistics. Because of the back then, there was no online submissions. Everything had to be hand delivered without packaging. It was what? the only way to get the, your submissions into. Yeah, into the National Portrait You Gallery. had to go to Great and Britain like, well, to so, deliver it by hand. It, that was what they were saying. So basically, I found an art handling company in London and just paid them to do it for me. Huh. And so by the time I got the painting there and back, I had spent probably 800 bucks to just get this thing looked at. And like, I was a, you know, barely made, like I said, my rent was probably was $250 and I wasn't thinking about like spending eight hundred dollars on shipping things to to get judged, um, but I got I got it and I got in there and I got in the show. They're like guys I knew that were in the show back then, like English dudes, older guys. They're like they'll never let an American win that. Like it's it's even though they say it's fair, they're like they would never. They have since for sure, but back then it was like 
they would barely let you submit because you because it was such a difficult process. Um, and then I got contacted by the advertising company that was working for the show and they said you're up for um you're one of the people that they that is potential for the catalog cover and then the guy's like but to be honest like they're probably not going to use you because you're american no <laughs> and then that was it last i heard of it and then i and then i see they put me on the cover of the catalog and then so it was great because they also put me on the banners in front of the national portrait gallery like that wow and then what an honor i didn't go to the show so so I didn't have any like money to go to the show because I was just, this, you know, barely, barely working. And like, you know, I hadn't really spent time going to Europe traveling or anything. And so I didn't get to see it. I just heard about it. And, and then oh, I went a couple man. of years later. And then when I went a couple of years later, I saw how the catalog piece was the banner on the museum. Two big banners, huge ones. And then all over London in the bus stops, they're advertising the show with that same piece. So my piece was like all over town. One of my buddies snuck a picture in the bookstore and it's just like a wall of the image like over and over and over because the catalog was fresh. And like, Oh, you're never so selling this painting. Exposure, I'm sure. I know. I mean, I, I had jokingly said I would sell it for a hundred thousand dollars. Um, <laughs> but even that, like probably I wouldn't, you know, at that point, that's not even that much money, but I did have one of my collectors at one point say, were you serious about that? Cause I kind of, no way oh, for an eight by 10. Oh was, crap, man. Yeah. And I was like, Oh, I don't know, man. And then I had some of the celebrity people that I teach say like, if I ever decide to sell it, they'll buy it. Let them know. I didn't say a hundred thousand dollars, but I'm just like, man, it's like the people I would want to own it if anyone was going to own it. That um, is nuts, man. But now I'm just kind of, now I have it. So I don't know. Yeah. So that one was for sale in that first gallery. I showed it, I showed out, I did the piece and I was so proud of it and they thought it was really cool, but it was too edgy for the gallery. They had it for sale for 2,500 bucks and couldn't sell, didn't sell it because of the subject matter. Lucky you. Which is crazy. And it, yeah, I'm, I'm so glad it didn't sell back then for that. You know, you get my 50%. percent yeah. much rather just keep it. Yeah, you'd and, have 1250 in the bank know, so, and on potentially a $100,000 yeah, painting. So it That's nuts, yeah, man. So, I mean, I don't know. I'll just keep it. I'll hold on to it now because it, at that point, it, it's got all the cool stickers on the back still from the National Portrait Gallery and all that. Yeah, here's, here's another one that I remember seeing way back when and just being yeah, floored. Same girl. Is it? Yeah, it's yeah, funny how yeah, profiles, just, you know, you can never tell sometimes when people yeah. turn sideways, they look completely different. Oh, for sure. Yeah, she's she's got the, her eyes especially change in the from the front. Mm -hmm. She um, she's just a friend of mine. Like she was actually at the time I met her through my framer and, and she'd kind of been around local tattoo piercing scene in Pasadena. So like some places I'd gotten tattooed, I guess she was around, but we just became good friends and, and I worked with her a bunch and um. Then she started doing more modeling for art classes because a, a couple of us were like working with her. Um, but then I had a I had a like a waiting list for paintings of her at one point because just these people everyone wanted those paintings. I don't know why. No and kidding. Just, but for me, when that happens, I'm like, okay, well, I'm not going to do that anymore. Then that's totally how like, I am. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, it's like we I, don't like money. And or I something. did. I stopped. Yeah, I just don't tell me what to do. <laughs> <laughs> Let me do what I want to do. But then I'm totally. like, what was I doing? You know, I, like I've made, like I like painting and I could have just made a bunch more and sold them. And, but I just resisted it instead. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> yeah. And then man, another one, another, I mean, this one's early too. So that's I her remember this also. One. Yeah. 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 Oh man. That you really did paint her a lot. A, yeah. And that one's like probably 60 inches across. Could be like a, 36 60 40 60 i don't know something like that inches um so that one yeah it's pretty big and i was just trying to do like a modern version of a reclining nude you know and that was it and i was just told her you you choose what you want to wear for it but this is kind of the idea that was at her that's her house uh her old apartment so that one the, the night before my solo show at this other gallery i was showing at that was really one that helped me a lot um I had to paint the whole background still the night before the opening. You got to be kidding me. And so I was, <laughs> so I was at the gallery and working on another eight footer of my friend, um, Natalia, where, and I was trying to fix that painting on the wall. And I think at 10 PM, I left the gallery with this piece, brought it home, painted 
till 10 a.m. Brought it, brought it back to the gallery, like so tired. But, you know, remember, this is how I trained in school. So it was fine. No big deal. Except that I had the opening to go to that night. So I needed to make sure I napped. But put it on the wall wet. This collector happened to be in there looking at a small piece. And he changed his mind and bought the big one for 25000 or whatever. And I was like, oh, it was all worth it. One whole wow. night of wet painting. He changed his mind. And I sold the other one, too, anyway, to somebody else. But, yeah, it was it was like, okay, that was cool. But yeah. I'm pretty sure every show I have has multiple wet paintings in it. And then this one, again, another yeah, one I remember. This, one. this one's newer, though. I thought this one was older. Not newer. I mean, yeah. it's 12 years old. Yeah, no. but... yeah, exactly. So it's funny how time flies. Yeah, that's yeah. on watercolor paper. I was kind of 8 by 10 also. Actually, um, during that time was doing some classes in like doing indirect painting from photos and stuff. And so like I started this one just as like a, a demonstration. I did the whole head in, in, the, in, a class, in front of a class. Hmm. Um, and then I submitted it for the National Portrait Gallery in America, whatever that Outwind Bootchever competition is. or whatever. Portrait Society of America, in. you mean? No, it's just called like... It's called the Outwind Bootchiever, some two, two oh, names. Oh, I'm not even um, familiar with that. Competition. They're okay. basically, you should check it out. I mean, it's a big, it's like the BP version in America, basically. You know, <laughs> How do I like, not know I that? The big prize was forty or $50,000 top prize or something crazy, huh. 25, I don't know. Okay. Again, I, you know, I, I've never, I've honestly never won an art competition. I'm, I'm so used to just, like I get in, but I'm like, always losing you i don't think are you i don't think you enter that many of them though. things that's <laughs> true because i get so discouraged after losing and the bp award after that is like first of all the bp award in my opinion it's like a shot in the dark because i mean they could do an installation piece one year well it's like if for you sure. do the porch side of america for example you at least know that they're after craftsmanship right, right, right? right. but if you do the bp yeah, award yeah, yeah. you could you could like carve carve your face on a piece of poop and and it might win you yeah. know you just never yeah, know yeah. honestly the that's funny yeah it's exactly what happened with the one in smithsonian there was first place was somebody built or i think it was this one a, a rig for a camera to scan across the table had somebody lay on the table and the, it was first place of this portrait competition the winner was a video scanning somebody's body yeah that's just stupid second place second place was some kind of bad animation and third place was photography and then like 50 runner-ups were painters portrait painters <laughs> in a portrait competition <laughs> at the national <laughs> portrait gallery in the Smithsonian. so yeah man yeah. it's exactly that like top three prizes are like the most kind of avant-garde medium and then every and then like the actual painters are just kind of there as runner-ups and that's how i feel yeah definitely like i would imagine portrait society has none of that but but the museum shows and those are for yeah. sure they have to like the i don't know the, the 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 team that's like checking them out is trying to be different i guess i guess so yeah I this one know. i got a little bit of exposure but i didn't get anything off of that one and and that was from a hockey fight that I didn't play yeah. well in. But <laughs> Maybe I, I feel like I knew that you were telling me that at one point. Because yeah, we had talked about, I still want to do this. Yeah. We had talked about trading self-portraits. Was that you I was telling, we were talking about that? Oh, or yeah, just, I would love to. Man, sure. we got to do that. That'd be sick. Yeah, that'd yeah. be fun. And it's, this so, one's yeah, from 2011 too. Okay. Yeah. So those those were all, I was doing watercolor paper a lot. And because I was doing these classes teaching this stuff, I would just, you know, try like if I had a friend nearby, I'd do a photo or I'd do self portrait because I could just kind of get the get some photos done for class to show them some things. And and I did this one in a class at Art Center. Was um, this multiple yeah, sittings or of... is this just a la primo, wet into wet, one day? Well, so I with these, I'll do a sitting of drawing and, with and then some a few acrylic washes to to sort of seal the drawing and and start to look at it. So that's what what I do. So that's a day. And then I let it, or half a day or a couple hours, and I let it dry. And then the oil's wet into wet. Okay. One sitting. So it's two layers. So I, two layers, yeah. The first layer is mostly just you see the drawing and the gesso board. And then the oil, because I learned in those classes, like I was talking about, we never did indirect painting. I only learned how to do it in one sitting. So I really just carefully render and I plot everything out. I keep, I, I actually treat it kind of painterly, more detailed in the detail areas. 
I do a big pass of covering everything very methodically. And then I go in with a, a beat up kind of old soft nylon brush that's frayed mm -hmm. and I just blend stuff and it'll go, it'll look like an indirect painting, a really indirect oil painting, you know, in one, one day, if you just like push that shit around. Right? Okay. So over, that over let's talk about that. Then let's get off. We'll go, we'll come back to your website for a minute, but since you brought up process a little bit, does this, mm -hmm. is this what you're describing? This doesn't well, look those, like so what those I'm are hearing. From life. Okay. No, because that'll that'll be done with um, that's done in a, as a demonstration for a class, so a couple hours, and I just do that's starting with a white canvas. I stain it. I draw with that same color. Draw it out on the fly. Then I use that same color to do all my dark, darkest darks. Like his hair and the shirt and the background and the drawing, even the lips are all one mix that I just have three colors in that I kind of push around. So a little more of the alizarin for the mouth and maybe a little more of, a, of one of the blues I used to make it cooler dark. This was also done as a limited palette. So I think I only, I used maybe a black mixture I made, but then I used yellow or garlic like or cat red light and white. So no, I mean, it's because of this that my studio practice is very much like paint by numbers and a lot of, often if I'm trying to get it done quickly it's it's almost like draw it carefully get that out of the way then we'll focus on the form and, and color separate so you'll draw um, the whole painting out for these and then you'll just yeah, like yeah, work yeah. on a head one day the torso the next totally, day yeah. Oh, yeah that's how I used to paint I love, when I was wet into wet yeah and then like if I've done it so I did a, a couple of bigger compositions we can talk about like I definitely work section to section because I found for me you know generally we do this back to front thing as traditional and work on the background and then do the details but I like such loose kind of abstracted shapes in the background that it's harder for me to judge how loose to go without having something tight already done right just to have the contrast because like I did a piece where I it was more environmental and campfire and I, I focused on the background for a long time and I could just never get the heads to like pop how I wanted them to because I'd spent more time maybe rendering the background than I should have or or I was comfortable with is this this one here that'd be like that campfire piece yeah yeah this time those heads are that's there's paintings right over there it's the heads are about like probably an inch or so you know and so I, I painted the dirt bike and the, and really was figuring out texture and those the background and this this thing never photographed really well, but I just would have probably been even looser and more painterly with some of that background if I had started with the portraits. Hmm. It's like that contrast of 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 tight and loose. And so like right. this one, I felt like when it got a little stiff in the background. I love the painting. I think it all came out, but yeah, I just remember that process beautiful. for me. Thanks. And that's just where I shifted back to like, no, I want to paint the details with the paint with the most of it being kind of white, and then I can really leave stuff alone. And there's actually a painting in there where I that I was working on at the same time. If you want to click back the the one with the big white table up left, um, go up. Uh, yeah, the, the, that one. So that's a pretty big painting. 40. Then what was what it? it by 60. I don't know. Something oh, yeah. 48 maybe. by 54. 4854. So decent sized painting, you know, but like the guy's head in the foreground is maybe like four inches and then my head in the background is like two. And that was one where I was like, I started purely with the portrait, the portrait. I painted hands one day, I painted another hand another day. And as I was doing that, I, you know, like if I paint one of the, like the portrait of the background, me in the background, as I do the portrait, I am painting, you know, a good few inches of the background around it. So that later when I paint the rest of the background, I have paint there already that I right, can you keep your edges soft into. yeah for edge control so so like I, I blocked in a bunch of the background as I was doing that and then basically realized once I had all these details that I never even needed to touch the background again there was moments that I was looking forward to painting in that background that I never went back to because it would have been a waste of time and no kidding are you talking better. about like areas like, like the, maybe in the doorway here and in the door, that ladder on the right, I kind of started blocking the shapes around it. And I was, yeah. like, I was really excited about that ladder. But by the time I got done with most of the painting, I'm like, I can't be excited about that ladder anymore. Like, I can't touch it because it's going to just get stiffer and stiffer. That red bar going across the center there, like, that's just the that's nasty wash. And I meant to, like, yeah, and I meant to, like, put highlights and shadows and grid on it. And at, by the time I was, like, with everything, I'm like, it's better like this. It's way Yeah, it's like cool. This. And then... Like that stack of wood on the left is where uh, there's a couple of parts where they were left the raw, raw ground. And then I painted them and that was like, well, that was a mistake. And 
I'll stop touching stuff now. Hmm. That whole white table that is just my ground. There's nothing on there. Zero oil. No way. It's just the canvas. Just, like my, just my my yeah my I paint on a panel, but it's just like raw acrylic. What? No white. way. Yeah. And it feels weird, you know, when you're standing in front of it because I did all this distortion with I think I put it together from like eight different photos, and so there's like a, a subtle fish eye happening where I didn't even and I and I even. Um, cut like i i added the collaging to the painting I, I didn't blend out like the door you can see where there's like steps along my collaging oh yeah and i painted it that way just to kind of make it i just wanted to paint something different and you know than i would instead of cleaning up all the perspective and and, and all those and blending i was like maybe it'll be just me with like more broken reality and be more interesting so i tried it out and then leaving the white table was like definitely not painting that you know i painted a few of the shadows on it but and the tools, but, but did you white. paint a little There's bit of white? Stains. Did you paint a little Zero bit of white around white the paint. objects to get the edges nice? Um, probably a little, not much. You can if, on no. the real painting, you can still see a bunch of pen, pen, you can see pencil sketching and stuff of some of those. No shapes kidding. Where I moved stuff, yeah. Did you yeah, say you, you sold this or no? Thin shadows. No, it's weird because that was one of my favorite pieces I've ever made, to be honest. But it was at a time where the galleries are like more tattooed women, and oh, I'm like, no, <laughs> I'm going to paint my guy friends now, shoot myself in the foot again, and make. And I said, did a whole show like the campfire and this one and a couple other pieces, and I didn't sell anything hmm. because I I was just like, I'm going to see what happens, and I saw what happened. I painted what I wanted to paint, painted my male friends, and like that was it. So this guy I went to school with, he's in my band, he's in the campfire painting. The guys in that campfire painting are the ones I played music with and went, i went to school with both of them and hmm. one of them lives next door actually so that's pretty cool man but that's yeah, this a, is a big painting. painting it's a lot of fun abstractions and like that big white table people say when they stand in front of it because i was took all the photos from up on a ladder this is like they say you feel like you're falling into this painting i'm like well that's cool because that's kind of what i was going for i guess but yeah i just i like the painting it's it's like one of that one in the campfire are two of my most proud painting moments and they're the two that i've kept and not on purpose the two i've had trouble selling wow they're not cheap i mean when they when you know when paintings get big they get expensive but i've had a handful of people say they want this they think about it and then they just don't do it hmm I also need some space it's, it's not not small man i wish i could afford it i'd buy it <laughs> it's gorgeous yeah, sure. I I don't mind like now we moved into this big house out in the edge of the woods, so now we have massive walls. So I'm kind of enjoying now that I have all them up on the wall. Mm -hmm. Been a, you know I haven't I even have one another one down there like ten feet across of me walking my 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 dog before he died. Ten His feet. Last walk like walking. Walk. It's like it's like maybe only three feet tall, but ten feet across. All wow. Framed, and that's on a long hallway down there. That's awesome. I might work on it again. So this one's a little different for you. This feels like almost wet. Well, yeah. I guess you've done, you did the campfire. This is kind of Western, but this feels more Western for some reason to me. I don't know why, but tell me, tell me yeah, a little about so this one. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. So same, same guys, same set of photos. We, we basically like, so those two dudes lived up here where I live now. They left the city and they moved up to this place, uh, kind of called Fraser park. There's other areas we live in near, um, and so I was coming to visit a lot because there's my buddies and we were, you know, we played music together. So we would rehearse, we started rehearsing up here because it's just, you can make noise, you know, you can shoot guns, do whatever you want here. Everyone has, they, the next door, they have like 180 acres or something of property. Uh, um, so, and I had dirt bikes and I was, I used to ride them and it was like perfect time to like stash them somewhere where I could ride because there's trails all over and, so we were just like hanging out, a lot of barbecue, a lot of drinking beer, shooting guns, dirt biking. It just started to feel like we we're like wild westing, you know, playing. Everything we we're doing seemed like we we're having so much fun. It seems like it should be illegal. Maybe some of it is, I guess. But um, <laughs> I just like it, you know, and I like the Western scene. I've always liked Western kind of themes, especially like an illustration. I'm not saying I like it now, what's going on necessarily, but I do still 
you know, I, I was a kid, loved my cow, cow. There's so many pictures of me with my like little gun belt and my plaid <laughs> shirt and my hat always. And so like, I just always had that. And I liked the Lone Ranger and, and you know, that market does well. I used to like go, go to the shows like the masters of the American West at the Autry, And I always liked it. You know, I, I definitely felt like it could be cooler and better, but so I just was, we were kind of living up here, playing around with stuff. So, you know, the dirt bikes in that picture, the campfires and, lots of beer drinking and even that one the same the one in the in the shop with the table like that was that same era where it's just like i'm just painting what i want to paint right now forget okay what all my galleries are like give me more tattooed girls i'm like no no more like every i had three galleries at the time and all three were asking me for that and i was starting to sell more on online myself and stuff and i was just like well i'm just gonna do more western and and, and i tried it i actually tried these with like maxwell alexander because they they have that good western connection and you know they uh, i don't maybe no maybe this one didn't i did this one for a show in san francisco so i was asked to curate a show in san francisco and i'm like well, okay well they said they only wanted three people in it. i'm like well perfect i've got two friends and we're making these paintings mm -hmm. <laughs> so we all did western themed paintings we took like guns and cameras and shit and all this gear out on out on dirt bikes out in these trails to like take these photo shoots and stuff some of them are local, like by the house, but some of them we actually had to like kind of st stupid, do stupid stuff riding into these like little over these hills into these canyons to get all our gear in there and take pictures. But so we just did a show together. We played we played music at the show together. We did a little acoustic set. We all did Western paintings. And it was in San Francisco, though, at a kind of modern gallery. So it probably was a bad choice, but it was like, take it or leave it. This is what I'm doing right now. And so that was part of that. Hmm. And, uh, yeah, just like, I That's think awesome. this might've even be, been me just setting up the camera, you know, a lot of times I'll paint something from my, when I'm setting up the settings on the camera and I liked kind of the dimmer, you know, part of day and the, 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 the depth of field with my buddy in back kind of painted him and then scraped his face down. And so, yeah, that's just part of that. We all had ponchos and different gear and, hmm. You know, yeah. kind of, I just did try to do like a, a modernized version of the Western stuff. So there's me doing a non-modernized version of Western stuff. Same yeah. dudes, same area. That's just right next door. We took the picture sitting on my pickup truck. And this one... I, I'm sitting on the roof of my pick. Whoops, sorry. I didn't mean to go back there. This one doesn't weird. have a title or anything on it. So what's the size on this one? Do you remember? Okay. Yeah, it's about it's like probably twelve by sixteen ish. Oh, it's so. a smaller Pretty painting. Small. That's what I thought. Yeah. So I in, I took these photos to do a big painting, a big solo show even, and I was referencing like the classic American illustrators. You know, like that's like a Howard Pyle palette, or or, or like a, what's the other guys? I mean, Dean Cornwell for sure. You know, just classic American illustration where they there was limitations to the amount of colors they could use for printing. But I love how black, white, and red looks, or black, white, and blue, or mm -hmm. black, white, and you know whatever anything muted. So I was just kind of referencing that, and then the image is referencing like the movie Stagecoach with John Wayne. Yeah. So this painting, I don't know if I mentioned, but this this painting was done for the um, National Cowboy Museum in Oklahoma. I got into some small works um, shows there. So I ended up having to paint it small because there was a size limitation, even though my thoughts of, of this were gonna be a, a much larger, at least like a 30 by 40 or, or, or larger. So um, I painted it small. The heads are probably like, I don't know, an inch. Yeah, so the cool thing about this one or the most honor I received from this piece is that it was bought um, for Steven Spielberg's uh, birthday present which is nice and it sits That's in there freaking I've seen nuts. pictures of it sitting in their pub. Yeah. It's he's super into kind of the historical guns and things. And when I was working on it too, um, I had been teaching his wife and stuff and she, uh, he, he was like talking about which guns were which and this and that. So it was kind of fun. How in the world but did yeah, you get, cool. did, did you get a job in, teaching in his wife? I mean, so that's some of this, like the chess set and stuff too, is all involved with some of those people. I, uh, she got into painting through, I don't know if she got in through Michelle Pfeiffer, but Michelle Pfeiffer takes a lot of art classes, has for many years, and they both showed up in a workshop of mine. And actually, it was Michael Grimaldi told Kate, I uh, told Michelle to um, find the person you want to paint like and see if they will mentor you. So she did that with me for years. So that, I was wow. teaching both of them, and I'd be at, 
I'd be at both you know, their ho- the, the Spielberg's house in LA and then Michelle was living in Northern California. So I was going to see my son too. So we all just kind of went back and forth every week and met up at whoever's place it was. And it was cool, man. It was like during the time we're just teaching, I was traveling a lot and working with those people. They came to Italy for one of my workshops and that was super fun. And, you know, it was like, wow, teaching has been really good to me. And so I, I embraced it for that period. Hmm. That's awesome, man. That sounds like a lot of fun. Having lived in LA, there's been plenty of crazy experiences in my, you know, having been here. I ate one time actually um, cracked whips with Michelle Pfeiffer, Pfeiffer. So I was like, it's weird that Catwoman and I got to whip together and I've even like swung <laughs> light, lightsabers. Like, yeah, that was just like, what is happening right now? But it was cool because I mean, I like bull whips. I have a bunch of them and stuff. So he brought the Catwoman whip to show me one time and we cracked some of the ones I had. What a life, man. Yeah, crazy. That's crazy. Yeah, I know. I've had some, it's definitely in LA specific, some of that stuff. Like, yeah. Yeah. So, all right. So here's one of the things I want to talk about. I've heard from people who've taken workshops from you that you have this thing called the mud palette. Is that right? Mm-hmm. So, I mean, the, I never call it that. Um, oh, you the guy don't? I learned from in school. Not really. I don't know. It's just, I, I just stress like organization of the palette, you know, and the idea with the mud that I was taught, I think it's because of the guy I learned from um, Michael Husser. He's, also, he, I guess he would call it a mud palette. And so like, and he taught so many people too, for generations, like my generation and other people out here that like, everyone just calls it that. And the idea is that if you start with mud, mud's your kind of unified version of the color, and then you can expand and, and you can make it warmer or cooler, but the, the mud part is where the unity comes in. So it's just mixing, it's an organizing a palette, mixing big piles and then kind of mixing off of that. But okay. I just, yeah, the mud, it's funny. People do say mud and I, and they associate that with me. There's probably been articles and magazines saying that too, but I, I literally never, I try not to say it maybe because I'm just trying to use other words that I didn't have my instructors use or something. Right. Right. All right. So just to be clear though, so you're basically getting a general, uh, are you getting a general flesh tone and then just pushing it in one direction or another, warmer, cooler? Is that darker, what lighter, you're saying? Yeah. Darker, so lighter. The, the main mixes that I teach and show will like in this picture will be the first one. I'll start with a, the black mix I use, which currently I use, I, when I was in school, we used this olive green from Windsor Newton. So it's like black. It's basically like a black and Indian yellow almost. It's just like the, the deepest dark green, deeper than like some of those other dark greens because it's actually made from black. And then that's that transparency of Indian yellow doesn't even really actually lighten it either. Um, so we use that and alizarin to kind of neutralize and make what was taught as black in school, but it never made black because the olive green was yellow and the alizarin's red. They met at a brown black. They had the common brown warmth to them. So I started playing with ultramarine and burnt umber and decided burnt umber it was just terrible color, it was too too dull and too opaque for me. And, and I kept the the brown black mixed the olive and alizarin and and then kept the the ultramarine. So I've been using those three colors to make black for way too long now. Um, but so I'll basically mix a pile of the black and then I'll dilute it to do the background wash. So you can see where it goes more bluish or whatever color you want. In his hair, I just took. Let, use less of the blue and use more of the alizarin and the olive. And, and in his eyes, I just leaned it a little more towards the the uh, ultramarine. But I'm basically working with my black pile at this point and just making quick little shifts as I draw down the face. But that's probably the first 20 minutes drawing that face. Mm-hmm. First 20 minutes set. And, and, and now I've sort of started looking at temperature and I've mapped everything out. And then second set, I mix a big background pile so I can kind of go the darker and lighter version, but I'll mix one color. It was darker on the light side and lighter on the dark side because of the position of the spotlight. This was actually in Scottsdale Mm -hmm. um, at the school. And then, so then, so it's like first the drawing or my darkest dark value and color pile. And then I mix a background and keep that out of the way because that's just kind of the environment. And then I mix a big shadow average. So this guy had such pale skin that there's so much dark and light within the shadows, but I still try and just mix a muddy, muddy average, like a brownish color that then I add, I make more red or orange for like the depth under the nose or 
maybe a little orange, like a red and yellow for the eye socket shadows to get that reflected light in the lips. I'll just paint, a, use a corner of that pile and add little reds to it, you know, but it all, it still always has a little bit of the pile in it. And then as I get to like the neck where like the fluorescent lights in the room are filling it in, I start putting like a tint of manganese blue into my shadows. So my shadow just has one pile that I go darker, lighter, warmer, and cooler with. And then that's it. Mm. And then that stage is done. And then you can see the picture three, I've started my dark lights. So I mix a big light average, which is probably easier to see than a shadow average for the students in some way. Just taken into consideration their complexion and the lighting hitting them. And I'll just make one pile. Like if I could buy a tube of that person, what is that pile? And I make the pile, commit to it. And then I start painting the dark parts of it and connecting the shadows. And then I just slowly go into the more into the average pile as I as I put little pink or blue or whatever I want to change it. Like that stuff that's showing on that third picture that looks like the lightest value is just the ground. I don't know. Right. Some people can't maybe. Yeah. No, it's clear where I'm sitting. Clearly, it's, yeah. Yeah. And then and then the next step is yeah. Just then, so I go dark lights, middle lights, high lights. You know, and that's it. And I'm done. And as I'm doing, so I've I've eliminated the drawing issues a lot in the beginning i do of dark to light completely so when i'm doing the shadow section i do the darkest shadows and then the lightest shadows are done last and then when i do my light side i do the darkest lights middle lights light lights it's just it's just going i, I like to really make steps and go start to finish it doesn't mean i never go back to doing shadows or background or a just drawing or whatever but for the most part i really try and work out each issue as I go and then, you know, I can, these are done and that's a three hour demo. I think that was actually with the model, with the class watching mm. three hours. You know, and the thing I'm I'll noticing here is that demos. they're not, the drawing is very consistent from, from stage one to stage four. I mean, you really, you really nailed it right yeah. at the beginning. Yeah. I was what, I mean, I think that's just the training and, and the, the way I was taught and like, and became to me the most efficient process. Like I, I used to do my demos like these for classes and they would take me the whole six hour first day of class. And it started to feel like I was boring people. So slowly I've got, and I started teaching three hour classes. And so um, it got to the point where I can knock one of these out fully talking about it, explaining everything with plenty of break time to chat and in three hours, you know, start to finish. And like, yeah, like when I draw it, I, if it doesn't look right in the drawing, I'm not going to start putting paint on it. Hmm. Okay. At least not when I'm demonstrating. It doesn't mean I don't do that at home. Like I'll start real loose and, and not draw and build up the drawing later. But like if I'm doing a teaching and a process, like I like to show them how you can get it done very efficiently. Yeah, that, that does. It really just feels like you've got a very clear direction, step-by-step yeah, -step process. It's, it's, yeah, and it's the same in every single one. Like that drawing done with the same thing, just a little more olive green this time. Um, very few brush strokes to fill in that. Like the shadow side on his face, that's like just the, the one mud color. I didn't even like adjust it for him. Hmm. I, I thinned it a little bit down by where the beard is, but I really, I probably put more red when I did the ear, but it's really like, at that, at the drawing stage is just the black mixture, and then at the shadow stage, I just did a quick background and like one shadow color. And then that third stage, I didn't even do the high, that picture doesn't have the highlights in it yet. Yet that actually has, has the ground showing. So, and I tend to make the ground close to the averages of the light, so that as I'm working dark to light, the image always reads. You know, like when you lay in your shadows, you have form. When you when you still, so when you're laying in your half tones, you still might have some form showing, but. So you still haven't put the highlights on in this one. No, I did. I think I, when I posted the step-by-step -step pictures, I just included, I didn't include the final. I posted okay. it as a separate picture. So this was just an old like step-by-step -step I had in my phone. And right, right. I forgot that that wasn't, that wasn't even addressed. That one's fully painted. Yeah. And that one's, yeah. So because, you know, the lighting comes from the top. So I'm basically like, because I'm working dark to light, I'm working back to front, dark to light and bottom to top. I really just, that's why you can see how they kind of just paint from the bottom up and then, yeah. and I'm done. Yeah, man. I mean, I love how process oriented you were. I need to, I need to take, you know, absorb some of that from you. My, I feel like I'm always like, uh, 
like trying to organize chaos and but you seem like you've just got mm -hmm. it really down like this is how it's done and you just do it the same way every time yeah if, at least for this for teaching and for the stuff because I, I i've taught all kinds too i've taught more illustration stuff and figure drawing stuff but for this specifically like it's the thing i've taught the longest and and maybe gotten the most efficient with you know, it might be considered boring sometimes too i guess you know there's no no room for happy accidents or or anything but or there is but i don't know recently i did two self-portraits and one of them i started with no drawing and i just started putting heavy paint down and it got there, but it was frustrating. Mm -hmm. And so the next day or two days later, I did one where I drew it out super carefully and painted very thin and very carefully just filling it in. And I finished this like fully rendered piece in a day and felt, felt, you know, like, okay, I needed to do that because the other one was like this other struggle. And I have ended up selling the one that I did second and the first one I had had trouble selling for some reason. Hmm. So I guess in some way, you know, I know what works for me. Works yeah, for I mean, that's how it is. You got to go with your temperament, what what works for you. Yeah. Um, and it works for, this works for like, again, for like the work thing. Like if it's your job, if you're going to paint a commission for somebody, sure, you can take a year. But if you can do the same painting for the same amount of money in, in a week, then would you? I hope so. Yeah, I agree. I know yeah, you mentioned so. that earlier. You were like, you know, for illustrators, um, well, you stress that in school, your teachers were like, hey, if you're an illustrator, you got to get this out fast or you're not going to make any money. But I was thinking, man, that's the same thing for a painter. I mean, if you if it takes you months and months to do a right. an eight by 10 portrait, you're going to have to sell it for a hundred grand just to pay your bills, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like if it's yeah, the time thing, like, I don't know, I just find like in a lot of fine art that didn't with those long cast drawings and that kind of mentality, like, are you setting up to be a working artist that can actually get paid a decent amount for your hours? Or are you just going to work at like for like, you know, minimum wage your whole life or something? Right? Yeah, I've, I've thought the same thing. And I when and when I yeah. when I'm teaching, I'm always stressing that. In fact, I have this sort of, uh, with my students, I have this pass off process where they have to, they have to prove competency or professionalism in each area of the curriculum. But there are times nice, when they've yeah. technically proven it, but they prove it slowly. In other words, they, they've done the assignment, say, let's say it's five times by themselves accurately, but it took them so long to get it done and done right. I'll have them do it more anyway, because it's they need to speed up or they're never going to make a living they need they need to understand it well enough to do yeah. it efficiently relatively quickly otherwise they're never going to make a yeah. living yeah like if you can sit down and figure out your hourly and it's coming out to five bucks an hour or something <laughs> you're doing <laughs> you're something toast. wrong yeah this yeah is, totally. i mean unless you don't have to I don't know, you know, honestly, to me, like I see a lot of those like ateliers and these like painters that are awesome that I've followed for a long time. And I just wonder if they even have to make money. Probably not. You yeah, know, maybe a not. Lot of them, I think they probably come come from money. So they have a different they can take all the time they want and just focus on the skills and whatever it takes. But like, man, I got to make so much money just to like stay alive out here in California and just to break even. Right. Like this, light, this like this never ending rat race hustle just to just to pay even and, and not not, you know, not neglect anything. Yeah. You know what, though? I know I'm, I'm going to take what you said literally. and It probably shouldn't be taken literally, but you said they can take time and just focus on the skills. But I would argue that being able to do something like this in three hours shows a heck of a lot more skill. <laughs> Right. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with that, too. I mean, yeah. I don't want to say that about myself, but it is. It's a skill. It's a it skill. Yeah. Anytime you do a thing, a thing that people can't do and it involves time and you can do it faster. I think that's absolutely the, a big part of the skill. Yeah, because I do think, yeah, anyone can just take the time and keep changing and changing until it's right. But like trying to do it in three hours without making with very few mistakes, I think, is, is definitely a, a harder gig. Yeah.
but you know, I mean, it's, it's also what I practiced because I've been teaching so much. And like I was talking about at some point I'm doing like seven classes a week and every class gets one to two demos. I mean, there was ten, like, I did some of the days at art center, those long days where I had to do, we were doing painting out the window. So looking at just like nature or whatever we had cityscapes and I do like 10 demos in one, in two, in one day or something, you know, just five for each class, just keep knocking them out, knocking them out. And you get faster. You do. Mm -hmm. I mean, unless you're not finishing your, unless your demos aren't getting finished, but like I'll do all kinds of demos. I'll, I'll do a head painting in an hour demo if, if I can, as long as the class can take in that much information quickly. Right. Right. And I won't stop talking the whole time. Right. There's no, like when I'm painting those demos, like I tell you every thought I'm doing, like every move and why, like, okay, I need to work on this part. So here's how I'm looking at it and here's how I'm going to do it. And here's why, and then we're going to try it and do it. And if it works, then, then great. And if it doesn't, then we fix it. But yeah. I explain every little bit of it. I like, it's just, I think I like that as a teacher. Like I've started to like, if I, if I'm in front of a model, like I need a class to talk to, I can't just do it by myself. Anymore. <laughs> You've and been be, teaching be a lot. Well, Holy cow. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, tons. You just need a mannequin in your studio. You can just talk to the mannequin. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Just, just talk to the dogs. It's fine. Yeah. yeah, you know, another thought I had when we were talking about this making a living thing is I've had numerous students or conversations with numerous students about how to price their work. And a lot of times students will say, so <clears throat> how much should I make for this? when it takes me three months to do it like so i have got this little portrait here it took me three months so i feel like i need to charge x because i've got this much time into it okay. so what you're saying is that if i were hiring basketball players for a basketball team then i'm going to pay the guy more who takes longer to make a free throw shot i'm going to pay that mm -hmm. guy more <laughs> instead of the one who can do it every time yeah. and quickly it can score quickly. Yeah. I mean, the, it, the logic right. is so backwards in the art world, but this took me so long. I need to be paid this much. And it's, it's really yeah. not that you got to learn to paint fast and make a living. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. I, I, I totally agree with that because what it's like, it's with tattooers too, you know, they do like the hourly work and you just like, well, you could take your time all day and just make a bunch of money and then never get it done. But is that better? Is that going to help your career in the long term? Are you going to be the guy that people want to go to or not? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's weird. And and then, but then there's the opposite hand where people are like, well, why don't you just make me a painting since you just do it, right? Yeah. Like it's also, it's like not that easy. It doesn't <laughs> yeah. just happen either. It's work. Yeah. Because now I'm experiencing more of that, you know, like I think because I've, you know, we're talking about painting prices, the game has changed a lot with social media and sort of, I don't know. I don't know if you still, do you do much gallery stuff anymore? Or? No, I haven't been in a gallery in 15 years. Yeah. So like, I don't know what's happening there. I don't do too much myself, but like I started selling more just privately through social media and it was cool for a while. It was good, but it feels like it's that part has dried up. Yeah. Like it was, a, it was to the point where I was selling more than the three galleries I had combined just on my own. So I'm like, well, what am I doing? Why, why even like hang out and wait for them? But it's just like oversaturated now. There's this amazing amount of talent out there. Um, there's so many people selling art for so cheap that not only is it going to hurt the future of their career, it's like something that's affecting some of us too, I think, in a way, you know. It's like when I now when I try and sell things online and I tell people the prices, they're like, are you crazy? I'm like, no, not at all. I haven't changed my prices in 15 years. Like, yeah, what are you talking about? You just don't, you just don't know that this is not for you i guess art collecting is not for normal people it's for people who have extra money to spend on stuff and it's not a necessity you know it's not like we're selling uh anything that people you know helps people i mean it does help people i think but in a way like there's a very small market for what we do and, and it's expensive it's just like it's not like we're here to saving lives or anything Right. Not, not consciously, I think in some way we, we do, but like, yeah, I, I hear it a lot. And I was talking to this one, one of the, some kid online who's really good at drawing. He's like, the most I've ever sold any drawing for was like 110 bucks. And I'm like, what dude? Like, I won't even make a phone call for that price. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. Seriously. What are you talking about wow. like, that's the most too. And like, if you just do that now, not only like 
it hurts people who have been doing it for a long time. I think it makes it makes it look like well, it's just what it is. It's cheap, but like he'll never get out of that. I don't think you know. No. How do you grow to like being successful if you just make it a hundred bucks for like days of work or whatever it is? You know, it's not like they're sketches; they're like finished pieces. Yeah, well, he won't be drawing very long. I mean, eventually he's going to have to have a full time job and stop drawing altogether. And you can't live like yeah, that. He already does, probably. Yeah. Yeah, probably. no. But it's just like I'm seeing it more and more and I'm hearing it more. You know, I hear it from people. I started doing stuff where I'm like making these little sales and I'm selling stuff for like less than half of what the galleries do a lot, a lot of time. But for people, it's just, it's too much for them. And it's like, I get it that it's too much. It's probably, I'm not out there buying stuff like that either, but like, it's not. This is what I've been doing a long time. You're just actually able to see it now. Yeah. Now you have access to me and my and my store. You don't have to go through a gallery who's just going to be up in your face telling you what it is, and people accept it. So mm -hmm. I don't know. It's trying to find that that ba that balance again between like getting off of social media, I guess, and maybe going back to some more of the old old ways of one on one dealing with people and and uh, showing in some galleries. You know, I think there's something to be said for that. There's just like a legitimacy when it's a gallery. Right. Anything goes online. Right. Yeah, I think I haven't shown in 15 years. I've been working on word of mouth, but I think at some point I'm going to have to get back into a gallery. Um, but who knows? Yeah. We'll see how that goes. But um, yeah, I mean, word of mouth has been great. And that's most of the, I think, our businesses from the time we started. It was just how you built it. Yeah. So I think for us, it's good because we can kind of dabble in like social media and these new outlets, but we still have that foundation of like what it's like to like walk around passing out business cards and like hustling to like mm -hmm. get eyes on your work and, and, uh, and just, and just deal like dealing with people, like talking to people, dealing with collectors, you know, doing it yourself instead of always through a screen and, and whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, that's yeah, true. I, mean, I think in, in some way we, We've been around longer. I, I, I do. I get to talk to my girlfriend, Kate, about that a lot because she came into the game like through Instagram because she's young, a little younger. And like it was a, like the marketplace there was pretty amazing for a bit. Easy to sell. A lot of stuff going on. But now, you know, when, but then when that struggles, then what do you do? You don't have this backup. You don't have like the list of people that have been collecting your work seriously, through, you know, through whatever your personal outlets for, for selling work. Right. So I see it kind of, kind of going both ways. You know, we've got a little bit of that old school, which helps us, but there's hmm. a lot of new ways to make money too. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. These are things I haven't really thought much about because I've never sold. Well, I shouldn't say never. I, I have, I've sold very little work online because I just feel like, how do you, how do okay. you sell expensive work on Instagram? You know, I mean, <laughs> You don't. Yeah, you sell the cheapest stuff. You sell prints. It's like, right, yeah. right. I mean, occasionally someone will message me and say, hey, my budget's $150. Can you paint my dead grandma? And I have to send this awkward email, you know? <laughs> I'm sorry, but yeah. I can't really do it, you know? And yeah, um, But like, that's about the extent. Uh, yeah, I don't like, like those. <laughs> no, it's always yeah, awkward. Yeah, I've sold a couple, you know. Yeah, I mean, I think like, you know, you're going to get a few people coming through here and there that might ask, but the majority, 99% of my uh, communication on Instagram is no. Mm -hmm. Is them saying no and me saying this is what it costs. Same, right. It's like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Like, it's what it costs. It's what it's always costed. You just found out. <laughs> I even yeah, tried, a... like, I tried putting expensive pieces on my website just to have, like, context for the studies. Or, like, okay, even though this painting I don't expect anyone to buy for $45,000 off of my website, I'm putting it there with an add to cart button because it's there and it's for sale for that price. And that's the price. And so the studies, you know, that are, uh, you know, a couple thousand or whatever, like, you can see why hopefully they're there, but then. It does. I don't know if that works or not. It doesn't seem to. Then mm. you just get people saying, I looked at your site and $25,000. Who do you think you are? Like, oh, God, no, you people go. don't say that. Are you serious? I've, oh, I've had, I've totally had that. I'm just like, no okay, way. I'm not even going to, I'm not going to engage and give you my whole history and the history of like <laughs> fine art and sales. You know, it's just like, you clearly oh, have man. no clue. And, and that's it. They go there to look and then just say stuff. I'd probably get the same thing if I listed prices on the web, but I've never had my prices up.
So now I'm, yeah, now I'm even I more think hesitant. I've taken them down now just because of it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I don't think it's good. But then you got to, if you're going to sell to, then you got to, it's just more of that, like dealing with people because I like having the prices so they can just say no to the air and not to me. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> yeah. I don't need, I know, I know what's coming. Yeah. So I've, I've tried it just to see if it would work, but it didn't, it just got me like, you know, hate mail, I guess. And that is nuts. People, people are crazy. That, yeah. Like, That's yeah, I'm just like, man, you you have no clue what kind of bills I have out here and stuff and where I'm at in my position in life and just weird. Right. Right. Yeah, just, and just how block, hard you work to them. be able to do what you do in a short amount of time. I mean, that's the thing. Back to the yeah, time like, thing. You worked hard to totally. learn how to do it fast. Right? It's yeah, not like you're absolutely. just a trick. And I still do. Yeah. Yeah. So it shouldn't get cheaper, but it feels like the world is requiring that my studies get cheaper, but I'm not, I'm not budging because I was always taught like you can't bring your work down, but right. It's just a weird, it's a weird world. So I'm thinking of just like dabbling in some galleries just to keep my foot in those doors a little bit, but it's all been word of mouth the last few years and it's fine. Teaching's good for that too. You meet a lot of people who have money and love art. So I think that's been pretty cool, especially workshops. So let me ask you one final question before we close here. So as an artist, and if you've listened to my podcast, you know what I'm going to ask you probably. <laughs> as an artist, I was trying what, to remember right now. Yeah, what advice would you give an aspiring young painter? Oh man. That's so tough because of like all the stuff we've talked about. Like what kind of world do we live in now? Like I mean, I guess what I, the one thing I like to tell people to remember, like to do or think about is like to don't, just don't forget like that why you started doing art, like, cause you, it felt good cause you liked it and that's it. And like, and for me, like it got to the point where I was working, using it so much for making money and you know, it's like a struggle if you live in an expensive place to just to stay alive. And it, it my relationship to art has definitely changed where it's like, just this thing I have to do, you know, but I've realized that I don't like that. So over the years, I've started to kind of just try and remember to find that love, keep that love for the painting and why I did it in the first place. And so I make little projects for myself and, or just having other outlets to do things I think for me is important, but I don't think that works for everybody. Some people really need to focus on that one thing and do it. Um, I'm, I'm not a good example of that, I would say, mm -hmm. but I just think like, Remember why, you know, remember why you're doing it, I think. You gotta love it. You gotta love it first and foremost. Even for me, like with the knives and blacksmithing, like I'm starting to make a little bit of money, but like if I don't love it, then why do it? Right. Right. I guess to make money, right? We gotta we also gotta make money. Uh, yeah. So it's, it's it's a balance, I would say. It's always a balance. Yeah. Yeah. But I've thought a lot about that. Like if you're gonna just work to make money, it would almost be easier to do something that's not so um personally and emotionally challenging absolutely you know what i mean 100%. so you gotta love it or you might as well have a job yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 definitely i'm working with a couple people who who are trying to get out of their real jobs they've got cool jobs but they want to be artists and i'm trying to like help them get to that le place but i'm also like but you you design stuff for astronauts and that flies in space. It's like, that's kind of cool, too. Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't know if you should quit being cool. an artist. <laughs> that is cool. Or I was just working with a guy who's like a de some guy who's a deputy. I'm like, I don't know. Do you want to like not work or do you want to be an artist and struggle? Or do you want to have like a solid job that covers your family and then maybe just do art because you love it still? I don't know. Yeah. It, it's hard to say, you know, because like, I, I don't know how old you are, but like, I was, I started pretty young, you know, I didn't really, there was no other, no other life that I, that I've experienced yeah, me neither. really, like as far as like working, I mean, I've done work, I've had to work construction, like I said, or work in restaurants and stuff, but, but I didn't really like have another career. And so I don't know at this point, like, I don't have a choice. I'm not going to go get a job, you know, unless it was like a teaching gig, but like, I'm not going to change what I'm doing. Like I'm it, I'm in, I'm in it. You know, I got to figure it out and I'm still trying to figure it out. I'm trying to figure out how to make everything that I do pay the bills I need them to pay so that I can keep doing what I need to do. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the thing that I'm getting that I get from you and I mean, obviously you and I relate cause we both have so many hobbies 
that we're passionate about. Mm -hmm. But I look at, you know, I interview a lot of artists and I know, as you do, I know a lot of artists that like just paint day in and day out and it's all they can do is paint. They just live yeah. and breathe, paint, 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 paint. That's not me and it doesn't sound like that's you. Um, mm -mm. But what's refreshing is that there's someone else out there and probably many more that have like a whole art life, like everything they do is their art. It's not just like the only, the only way to be an artist is, is with paint. And with oh, you, yeah, you're so no, good sure. at it. I mean, you can make a living absolutely. doing any of those things. I'm trying, I'm trying to make a living doing all of them, but yeah, no, I feel that like I was just baking sourdough this morning and I spent all, you know, I spent yesterday, like caring for this loaf of, you know, like stretching it, shaping it, doing all this stuff. And like, you know, it's just, and then after this, I'll go eat that, but I'll probably go play guitar too for a while before I figure out like what I got to paint or, you know, or teach or, you know, whatever. But yeah, it's just a little, I, I, I've been thinking about that same thing too. Those, like some of the painters that we might know who just, that's all they do. But then and also, I think a lot of them aren't 20 years into it yet. And we'll see, we'll see some changes. Maybe. Yeah, maybe. Maybe. I don't know. Like, but I, 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 I'm absolutely like, I love seeing guys like you where it's just like, oh man, that makes me feel more, a little better. Like you have a whole page of like stuff that you're built, building and working on. And like that to me is like, that's way more interesting than just doing that one head down thing. I don't know. But not that I didn't, you know, I, I did the painting thing for just painting and, and just that for a long time and teaching, but I was still playing music probably. And, and, and I, and I do think even sports like hockey, there's a huge, huge outlet there for creativity and just physical outlet. I mean, I think hockey is like a chess match, you know, and you're working with other people to try and like win that chess game. And there's a lot of that in there. And I do miss that. I miss, I love the challenge of like playing with a team and trying to win something. Like I miss that because I haven't played in a couple of years just because I live far away now. It's hard to, something mm -hmm. had to give, you know, with all the stuff I did. Yeah, no kidding. And, and it was the, the hockey. Yeah. But I need it. I think I need it back. Yeah. Well, thanks, man. It's been a huge honor having yeah, you on yeah, the podcast. Yeah, I'm glad. Glad we finally got to deal with all the sicknesses and delays and stuff. Yeah, I appreciate it. All right, man. Have a good one. Yeah, it's a real honor. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for tuning in to the Undraped Artist Podcast. If you enjoyed it, subscribe. And if you could, leave a comment or review. That really helps the channel. Please share this show with your friends, and if you're feeling generous, consider a monthly donation at theundrapedartist.com. Thanks again for watching. We'll see you next week.